Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Tesla's second quarter 2024 Q&A webcast. My name is Travis Axarod, Head of Investor Relations, and I'm joined today by Elon Musk, Debov Teneja, and a number of other executives. Our Q2 results were announced at about 3 p.m. Central Time in the update deck we published at the same link as this webcast. During this call, we will discuss our business outlook and make forward-looking statements. These comments are based on our predictions and expectations as of today. Actual events or results could differ materially due to a number of risks and uncertainties, including those mentioned in our most recent filings with the SEC. During the question and answer portion of today's call, please limit yourself to one question and one follow-up. Please use the raise hand button to join the question queue. Before we jump into Q&A, Elon has some opening remarks. Elon? Uh, thank you. So to recap, uh, we, we saw large uh, adoption acceleration in EVs um, and then a bit of a hangover as others struggle to make uh, compelling EVs. Um, so there have been quite a few um, competing electric vehicles that have entered the market um, and mostly they have not done well, but they have discounted their EVs very substantially, which um, has made it a bit more difficult for, for Tesla. Uh, we don't see this as a long-term issue, but, but really as fairly short-term. Um, and uh, we still obviously firmly believe that EVs are best for customers and that uh, the world is headed for a, f a fully electrified transport, uh, not just of cars, but also of uh, aircraft and boats. Um, despite many challenges, the Tesla team did a great job executing um, and we did achieve record quarterly revenues. Energy storage deployments reached an all-time high in Q2, uh, leading to record profits for the energy business. And uh, we're investing in many future projects, including uh, AI training and, and, and inference, and uh, a great deal of in infrastructure to support uh, future products. Um, we, we won't get too much into the product roadmap here because that is uh, reserved for product announcement events. Uh, but we are in fact to develop to deliver a more affordable model in the first half of next year. Um, the, the big, the really, by far the biggest differentiator for Tesla is autonomy. Um, uh, in addition to that, we we have scale economies and we're the most efficient electric vehicle producer in the world. So, uh, is this anyway. <clears throat> While, while others are pursuing different parts of the AI robotic stack, we are pursuing all of them. This allows for better cost control, more scale, quicker time to market, and a superior product. Uh, applying not to not just to autonomous vehicles, but to autonomous humanoid robots like Optimus. Uh, regarding full self-driving and robotaxi, uh, we've, we've made a lot of progress with full self-driving in Q2, and with version 12.5, beginning rollout, uh, we think customers will experience a step change improvement in uh, how well supervised full self-driving works. Uh, version 12.5 has five times the parameters of 12.4 and will merge, finally merge the uh, highway and city stacks. Um, so the, the, the highway stack is still, at this point, is pretty old. Um, so often the issues people encounter are on the highway, uh, but uh, with 12.5, we, we finally merged the two stacks. Um, well, I still find that, that um, most people actually don't know how good the system is. And I would encourage anyone to understand the system better to simply try it out and let, let the car drive you around. Um, one of the things we're going to be doing just to make sure people actually understand the capabilities of the car is when delivering a, a new car um, and when picking up a car for service to just show people how to use it and just drive them around the block. Uh, once people use it at all, the, they, they tend to continue using it. So it's, uh, it's very compelling. And, um, and then this, I think, will be a, a, a massive demand driver. Even unsupervised full self-driving will be a massive demand driver. Um, and as we increase the miles between intervention, it will transition from supervised full self-driving to uh, unsupervised full self-driving, and we can unlock uh, massive potential in the fleet. Um, 
we postponed the sort of robo taxi or the sort of product uh, uh, unveil by a couple months. Where where it's shifted to ten ten, so the tenth of October, um, and this is because I, I wanted to make some important changes that I think would improve the the vehicle, the the, the, the sort of the robo taxi, the thing that thing that we're the main thing that we're going to show, and and we're also going to show off a couple of other things. Um, so moving back, moving it back a few months allowed us to improve the it, the robo taxi as well as add in a couple other things for uh, for the product unveil. Um, we're also nearing completion of the south expansion of Giga Texas, which will house our largest clip training cluster to date. Uh, this will be an incremental 50,000 H100s plus 20,000 uh, of our uh, hardware 4 or AI5 uh, Tesla AI computer. Um, with, with Optimus, uh, Optimus is already performing tasks in our factory, um, and uh, we expect to have Optimus production version one and in limited production starting early next year. Uh, this will be for Tesla consumption. Uh, it's just better for us to iron out the issues ourselves. Um, but we, we expect to have several thousand Optimus robots uh, produced and doing useful things by the end of next year uh, in the Tesla factories. Uh, and then in 2026, ramping up production quite a bit um, and at that point, we'll be providing Optimus robots to uh, outside customers. That'll, that'll be production version two of Optimus. For the energy business, uh, this is growing faster than anything else. Uh, this is, we're, we're really um, demand constrained rather than production constrained. So we're ramping up production in our US factory as well as uh, building our building the mega back factory in China that uh, should you know, roughly double our output. Maybe more than double our output. Maybe may triple, potentially. So, um, in conclusion, we're super excited about the progress across the board. Um, we're changing the energy system, how people move around, how people approach the economy. The undertaking is massive, but I think the future is incredibly bright. Uh, you know, I, I really just can't emphasize just the, the importance of autonomy uh, for the vehicle side and for Optimus. Um, although the numbers sound sound crazy, um, I think Tesla producing app volume with with uh, unsupervised MSD essentially enabling enabling the fleet to operate like a giant autonomous fleet um, and it, it, it takes the valuation, I think, to some pretty crazy number. ARK Invest thinks on the order of $5 trillion. I think they're probably not wrong. Um, and long-term Optimus, I think, is, is achieves a valuation several times that number. Um, I want to thank the Tesla team for strong execution and looking forward to exciting years ahead. Great. Thank you very much, Elon. And VebOp has opening remarks as well. Thanks. As Elon mentioned, the Tesla team rose to the occasion yet again and delivered on all fronts with some notable records. In addition to those records, we saw our automotive deliveries go sequentially. I would like to thank the entire Tesla team for their efforts in delivering a great quarter. On the auto business front, affordability remains a top of mind for customers. And in response, in Q2, we offered attracting financing options to offset sustained high interest rates. These programs had an impact on revenue per unit in the quarter. These impacts will persist into Q3 as we have already launched similar programs. We're now offering extremely competitive financing rates in most parts of the world. This is the best time to buy a Tesla. I mean, if you're waiting on the sidelines, come out and get your car. We had a record quarter on regulatory credits revenues and as well. On net, our auto margins remain flat sequentially. It is important to note that the demand for regulatory credits is dependent on other OEMs' plans 
for the kind of vehicles they're manufacturing and selling, as well as changes in regulations. We pride ourselves to be the, the company with the most American-made cars and are continuing our journey to further localize our supply chain, not just in the US, but in Europe and China, as well for the respective factories. As always, our focus is on providing the most compelling products at a reasonable price. We have stepped up our efforts to provide more trims that have estimated range of more than 300 miles on a single charge. We believe this, along with the expansion of our supercharging network, is the right strategy to combat range anxiety. Since the revision of FSD pricing in North America, we've seen adaption rates increase meaningfully and expect this to be a driver of vehicle sales as the feature set improves further. Cost per vehicle declined sequentially when we removed the impact of Cybertruck. While we are experiencing material costs trending down, note that there is latency on the cost side and such reductions would show up in the PL when the vehicles built with these materials get delivered. Additionally, as we get into the second half of the year, it is important to note that we are still ramping Cybertruck and Model 3 and are also getting impacted by varying amounts of tariffs on both raw materials and finished goods. While our teams are working feverishly to offset these, unfortunately, it may have an impact on the cost in the near term. We previously talked, talked about the potential of the energy business and now feel excited that the foundation that was laid over time is bearing the expected results. Energy storage deployments more than doubled with contribution not just in, from Megapack but also Powerwall, resulting in record revenues and profits for the energy business. An energy storage backlog is strong. As discussed before, deployments will fluctuate from period to period with some quarters seeing large increases and others seeing a decline. Recognition of storage gigawatt hours is dependent on a variety of factors, including logistics timing as we send units from a single factory to markets across the world, customer readiness, and in case of EPC projects on the construction activities. Moving on to the other parts of the business, service and other gross profits also improved sequentially from the improvement in service utilization and growth in our collision repair business. The impact of our recent reorg is reflected in restructuring and other in on the income statement. Just to level set, this was about $622 million of charge which got recorded in the period. And I want people to remember that we've called it out separately on the financials. Sequentially, our operating expenses, excluding such charges, reduced despite an increase in spend for AI-related activities and higher legal and other costs. On the CapEx run, while we saw a sequential decline in Q2, we still expect the year to be over 10 billion in CapEx as we increase our spend to bring a 50K GPU cluster online. This new cluster will immensely increase our capabilities to scale FSD and other AI initiatives. We reverted to positive free cash flow of 1.3 billion in Q2. This was despite restructuring payments being made in the quarter and we ended the quarter with over 30 billion of cash and investments. Once again, we've begun the journey towards the next phase for the company with the building blocks being placed. It will take some time, but it will be a rewarding experience for everyone involved. Once again, I would like to thank the entire Tesla team for their efforts. Great, thank you very much, Vibhav. Uh, now let's go to investor questions. Uh, the first question is, uh, what is the status on the Roadster? Uh, with respect to the Roadster, we've completed most of the engineering. And um, I think there's uh, still some upgrades we want to make to it. Uh, but uh, we expect to be in production with the Roadster next year. Great. It'll be something special. Like a whole thing, I think. Fantastic. Uh, the next question is about timing of RoboTaxi event, which we've already covered. Uh, so we'll go, to, we'll go to the next question. Uh, when do you expect the first RoboTaxi ride? Um, I guess that, that's really just a question of when do I expect the first, when can we do unsupervised full self-driving? Um, it's difficult, obviously, <laughs> my opt my, my Predictions on this have been overly optimistic in the past. So, um, I mean, 
based on the current trend, it seems as though we we should get miles between interventions uh, to be high enough uh, that it's too far enough in excess of humans that you could do unsupervised, possibly by the end of this year. I would be shocked if we cannot do it next year. So next year seems highly probable to me based on points simply plus the points of the curve of miles between intervention that trend exceeds uh, humans for sure next year. Um, so, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, our third question is, the Cybertruck is an iconic product that uh, wows everyone who sees it. Do you have plans to expand the cyber vehicle lineup to a cyber SUV or cyber van? Uh, I think we want to limit um, product announcements to when we have a special a specific product announcement event uh, rather than earnings calls. Great, thank you. Our next question is, uh, what is the current status of 4680 battery cell production and how is the ramp up progressing? Yeah. Uh, 4680 production ramp strongly in Q2, delivering 51% more sales than Q1 while reducing cog significantly. Uh, we currently produce more than 1,400 cyber trucks of 4680 cells per week and we'll continue to ramp output as we drive costs down further towards the cost parity target we set for the end of the year. We've built our first validation cyber truck with dry cathode process made on our mass production equipment, which is a huge technical milestone and we're super proud of that. Uh, we're on track uh, for production launch with the dry cathode um, in Q4 and this will enable cell costs to be significantly below available alternatives, which was the original goal of the 4680 program. Great. Thank you very much. The next question is, any update on Dojo? Yeah, so, so Dojo, um, uh, I should preface this by saying I'm incredibly impressed by NVIDIA's execution and the, the capability of their hardware. Um, and what we are seeing is that um, the demand for NVIDIA hardware is so high that uh, it's often difficult to get the GPUs. Um, and uh, there the, the just seems this, I, I guess I'm quite concerned about actually being able to get state-of-the-art NVIDIA GPUs when, when we want them. Um, and uh, I think this therefore requires that we um, put a lot more effort on Dojo in order to have, in order to ensure that we've got the training capability that we need. Uh, so we are going to double down on Dojo, uh, and we do see a path to being competitive with NVIDIA with, with Dojo. And I think we, we, we kind of have no choice because um, the demand for NVIDIA is so high and, and the, 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 it's, it's obviously there their obligation essentially to raise the price of GPUs to whatever the market will bear, uh, which is very high. So uh, I think we've, we've um, really got to make Dojo work and we will. Great. Uh, the next question is, what type of accessories will be offered with Optimus? <laughs> <laughs> There's Optimus is intended to be a generalized humanoid robot um, with a lot of intelligence. Uh, so it's like saying, what kind of accessories would be offered with a human? Uh, it's it's just really intended to be able to be backwards compatible with human tasks. So it would, you know, use any accessories that a human would use. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, do you feel you're cheating people out of the joys of owning a Tesla by not advertising? Uh, we're doing some advertising. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, I'll say something. Uh, you know, our fundamental belief is that we need to be providing the best products at a reasonable price to the consumers. Just to give you a fact, in U.S. alone in Q2, over two-thirds of our sales were to deliveries were to people who had never owned a Tesla before, and which is encouraging. We have spent money on advertising and other awareness programs, and we have adjusted our strategy. We're not saying no to advertising, but this is a dynamic play, and we know that we have not exhausted all our options, and therefore plan to keep adjusting 
but in the later half of this year as well. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question is on energy growth, which we already covered in opening remarks. So we'll move on to the next one. Uh, what is the updated timeline for Giga Mexico and what will be the primary vehicles produced spatially? Well, we, we, we currently are paused on Giga Mexico. Um, I think we need to see just where things stand after the election. Um, Tr Trump has said that uh, he will put heavy tariffs on vehicles produced in, in Mexico. So it doesn't make sense to um, invest a lot in Mexico uh, if that is going to be the case. So we, we kind of need to see where things play out politically. Um, however, we are increasing capacity at our existing uh, factories quite significantly. And I should say that the, the cyber taxi, or robo taxi, will be, will be produced um, here at uh, our headquarters at Keka, Texas. All right, thank you. Sorry, as will, and, and as will Optimus um, uh, towards the end of next year for Optimus production version two, uh, the high volume version of Optimus will also be produced here in Texas. Great, thank you. Just a couple more. Um, is Tesla still in talks with an OEM to license FSD? Uh, there are a few major OEMs that have expressed interest in licensing Tesla or Tesla full self driving. And I suspect there will be more over time, um, but we can't comment on the details of those discussions. All right, thank you. And the last one, um, any updates on investing in XAI and integrating Grok into Tesla software? Well, I should say that uh, Tesla is learning quite a bit from XAI. It's been actually helpful in advancing full self-driving um, and in building up the, the new Tesla data center. Uh, with regarding investing in XAI, I think we'd need to have a shareholder approval of any such investment. Um, uh, but I, I'm, I'm certainly supportive of that if shareholders are. Uh, but we probably, I think we need a vote on that. And um, there, I think that there are opportunities to integrate Grok uh, into Tesla software, yes. All right, thank you very much. And now we will move on to analyst questions. Uh, the first question comes from Will Stein from Truist. Uh, Will, please go ahead and unmute yourself. Great. Thanks so much for taking my question. And this relates a little bit to the last one that was asked. Uh, Elon, I share your uh, strong enthusiasm about AI, and, and I recognize Tesla's opportunity to do some great things with the technology. But um, there are some concerns I have about Tesla's commercialization, and, and that's what I'd like to ask about. Specifically, there were some news stories through the quarter that indicated that you redirected some AI compute systems that were destined for Tesla instead to uh, XAI, or perhaps perhaps it was to X, I'm not sure. And similarly, a few quarters ago, if you recall, I asked about your ability to hire engineers in this area, and you noted that um, there, there was a great desire uh, for, for some of these engineers to work on projects that you were involved with, but some of them weren't at Tesla, they were instead at XAI or perhaps even X again. So the question is, when it comes to your capital investments, your AI R&D, your AI engineers, how do you make allocation decisions among these various ventures? And how do you make Tesla owners comfortable that you're doing it in a way that really benefits them? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think you're referring to a very, uh, like an old article um, regarding uh, GPUs, uh, um, and that's like six, six or seven months old. Uh, Tesla simply had no place to turn them on. So it would have been a waste of Tesla capital because we would just have to order H100s and have no place to um, turn them on. So it was just, there was, this wasn't a, let's pick XAI, XAI of, a, of a Tesla. There's, there was no, the, the Tesla data centers were, were full. There was no, no place to actually put them. Um, the we're, we're, we've been working 24/7 to complete the South Extension on the Tesla big factory here in Texas. That South, that South Extension is what will house the 50,000 H100s, um, and we're um, we're beginning to move the uh, H100 server racks uh, into place there. But 
we were re really needed we needed that to, to be complete physically it, you, you can't just you know order compute or a gpus and, and turn them on but no you need you need a data center it's not possible so i want to be clear that was um uh, in, in tesla's interest not contrary to tesla's interest does tesla no does tesla no good to have gpus that can't turn off um the split second the that south extension is able to take gpus uh which is really just this week um we are moving gpus in there and we'll bring them online um with regard to uh xai the um there, there are people that, that only want to work on agi um so what i was finding was that when trying to recruit people to, to tesla they it, it, they they were they were only interested in working on API, not not to tell them specific problems, um, and uh, and they want to start a to do a startup. Um, so it was a case of either they go to a startup or uh, and I'm involved, or they do a startup and I'm not involved. Those are the two choices. Um, this wasn't uh, oh. The, they, they were they, they would come to Tesla. They were not going to come to Tesla under any circumstances. Um, so, um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I would even add that, you know, AI is a broad spectrum. And there are a lot of things which, you know, we are focused on full self driving as Tesla and also Optimus. But there's the other spectrum of AI which we're not working on. And that's the kind of work which other other companies are trying to do in this case XAI. So we, you have to keep that in in mind that it's a broad spectrum. It's not just one specific thing. Yeah, and once again, I want to be just repeat myself here. I tried to recruit them to Tesla, uh, including to say like you can work on AGI if you want, and they refused. Only then was XAI created. I, I really appreciate that clarification. If I can ask one follow-up, it relates to uh, the new uh, vehicles that you're planning to introduce next year. I understand uh, this is not the venue for uh, product announcements, but when we think about the focus, I've heard on the one hand that the focus is on cost reduction. On the other hand, you also said that the Roadster would, uh, would come out. Should we expect other, maybe more limited variants, like um, similar to the cars that you make today, but with you know some changes or improvements or different um, some other variability in the form factors? It, should we expect that to be a significant part of the strategy in the next year or two? I, I don't want to get into the details of product announcements, um, and. Um, and we have to be careful of the Osborne effect here. So, uh, you know, if you start announcing some great thing, it, it affects our near-term sales. Um, we're we're going to um, make great products in the future, just like we have in the past. And a story. Great. <clears throat> um, the next question comes from Ben Callow from Baird. Uh, ben, please go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi, uh, thanks for taking my question. Uh, when we think about revenue contribution and with energy growing so quickly and, you know, optimists on the come, how do we think about, you know, the overall segments longer term? And then do you think that auto revenue will fall below 50% of your overall revenue? And then my follow-up is just on the last call, you talked about uh, distributed compute on your new hardware. Could you just update us and talk a little bit more about that, the timeline for it, and you know how you would reward uh, customers for letting you use their their compute power in their cars? Thanks. Yeah, I mean, as I've said a few times, I, I think the long term value of Optimus will exceed that of everything else that Tesla combined. So um, it's simply if you just simply consider the, the usefulness, utility of a humanoid robot. Uh, that can do pretty much anything you ask of it. Um, it that, I think everyone on Earth is going to want, want one. There's eight billion people on Earth, so that's eight billion right there. Then you've got uh, all of the industrial uses, which is probably at least as much, if not way more. 
So I suspect that the uh, long-term demand for general-purpose humanoid robots is in excess of 20 billion units. Um, and uh, Tesla is a, has the most advanced humanoid robot in the world, uh, and it's also very good at manufacturing, which these other companies are not. Um, and we've got a lot of experience with, with the, the most experience, we're, we're the world leaders in real world AI. So we, we have all of the ingredients. We, I think we're unique in having all of the ingredients necessary for large scale, high utility, generalized humanoid robots. Um, but that's why, I'm, I'm, you know, my rough estimate long term is in accordance with the ARK Invest analysis of, you know, market cap of on the order of $5 trillion for, uh, maybe more, for autonomous transport. Um, and it's several times that number for general purpose humanoid robots. Uh, I mean, at that point, I'm not sure what money even means. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, in, in the benign AI scenario, we're headed for an age of abundance where there is no shortage of goods and services. Ever, anyone can have pretty much anything they want. It's a, it's a wild, very wild future we're headed for. And on the distributed compute? Yeah, distributed compute. Um, that seems like a pretty obvious thing to do. Um, I, I think the where the distributed compute becomes interesting is with our next generation Tesla AI uh, chip, which is hardware five, or what we're calling AI five, which is um, from an, from the standpoint of an inference capability uh, comparable to a V two hundred and a bit of V two hundred. Um, and we're aiming to have that uh, in production at the end of next year and scale production in 26. Um, so it just, just seems like if you've got, even if you've got uh, autonomous vehicles that are operating for 50 or 60 hours a week, there's 100, 168 hours in a week. So you have somewhere above, uh, I think, 100 kind of. Neural net computing. I, I, I think we're, we need a better word than GPU because GPU means graphics processing unit. So there's a higher hours plus per week of AI compute, AI inference compute from the fleet, from the vehicles, and probably some percentage from the humanoid robots. That it would make sense to do distributed inference. And if you get, if there's a fleet of, you know, at some point, 100 million vehicles with AI5 and beyond, because you have AI6 and 7 and whatnot. Um, and there may be billions of humanoid robots. That is just a staggering amount of, of inference compute or that, that could be used for general purpose like computing. It doesn't have to be used for uh, the humanoid robot or for the car. So I think you know, that's, just, that, that, that's, a, that's a pretty obvious thing to do. Say like, well, it's more useful than having to do nothing. Um, yeah. All right, thank you. Uh, the next question comes from Alex Potter from Piper. Uh, Alex, please go ahead and unmute yourself. Perfect, thanks. Um, wanted to ask a question on FSD licensing. You mentioned that in passing previously. It was just wondering if you can elaborate maybe on the mechanics of how that would work. Um, I guess presumably this would not be some sort of simple plug and play proposition that presumably a, an OEM would need, I don't know, several years to develop its own vehicle platform that's based on FSD. I, I, I imagine they would need to adopt Tesla's electrical architecture, compute, uh, sensor stack. So I, I, correct me if I'm sort of misunderstanding this, but if you had a cooperative agreement of some kind with another OEM, then presumably it would take you several years before you'd be able to recognize licensing revenue from that agreement. Is that the right way to think about that? Uh, yes. The OEMs do not move fast. Um, there's not really a sensor suite. It's just cameras. Uh, but uh, they would have to integrate our AI computer and have cameras with, with a 360-degree view. Um, and 
at least the gateway, like the what, what talks to the internet um, and communicates with the Tesla system, would, would that you need kind of a gateway computer too. So it's really a gateway computer with the cellular and Wi-Fi connectivity, the Tesla AI computer and um, seven cameras, or not cameras, again, a 360 degree view. Uh, but the, the, this will, given, given the speed at which uh, the auto industry moves, it would be several years before this, you would see this in volume. Okay, good. That's that's more or less what I expected. So then the follow-up here is if you did sign an FSD licensing agreement with another automaker, when do you think you would disclose that? Would you do it right when you sign the agreement or only after that multiple years has passed and the vehicle is ready to be rolled out? I think it depends on, on the air. The OEM, I, I guess, would be happy either way. Um, yeah, it, it depends on you know what kind of arrangement we enter into. A lot of those things are we've not ironed those out yet, so we'll make that determination as and when we get to that point. All right, and, and the, the kind of deals that that are obviously relevant are only if you know. Some OEM is willing to do this in a million cars a year or something significant. It's not, not if it's like 10,000 or 100,000 cars a year. We could just make that ourselves. All right, thank you. Uh, the next question comes from Dan Levi from Barclays. Uh, Dan, please go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi, good evening. Thanks for taking the questions. First, wanted to start with uh, a question on Shanghai. You've leveraged Shanghai as a uh, as an export center, really due to its low cost, and that makes sense. Um, but maybe you can just give us uh, a sense of how the strategy changes, if at all, given uh, the implementation of tariffs in Europe. Also, to what extent uh, your uh, import of batteries from China into the US, how that might uh, change given the tariffs. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, I covered some part of it in my opening remarks, but just to give you a little bit more, just on the tariff side, the European authorities did sample certain other OEMs in the first round to establish the tariffs for cars being imported from China into Europe. While we were not picked up in our individual examination in the first round, they did pick us up in the second round. They, they visited our factory, they, we worked with them, provided them all the information. You know, as a result, we, we are adjusting our import strategy out of China into Europe. But, and you know, one other thing to note is in Q2 itself, we started building right-hand model wires out of Berlin and we also delivered it in UK. And, you know, the, the, we're adjusting as needed, but, you know, we will keep adjust. We're still importing Model Threes into Europe out of Shanghai, and you know, we are still evaluating what is the best alternate to manage all this. Just on the examination by the European authorities, like I said, we cooperated with them well. We are confident that they we should get a better rate than what what they have imposed for now. But this is literally evolving and we are adjusting as fast as we can with this. It, it is, I would also add that, you know, because of this, you've seen the impact that Berlin is doing more imports into places like Taiwan, as well as, you know, uh, UK I just mentioned. So it will keep changing and we will keep adapting as we go about it. Green Ray, do you have Thanks. And, yeah, thank you. Um, as as a follow up, I wanted to ask uh, about uh, the the robotaxi strategy, and specifically, the the shareholder deck here notes that the release is going to be one of the gating factors is regulatory approval. So maybe you could help us understand, um, you know, which regulations specifically are the ones that we should be looking for. Is it FMVSS? That's uh, uh, standard, and then you know, to what extent does the strategy shift? You've done with FSD more of a, a nationwide, uh, no boundary approach. 
is the robo taxi approach one that's more geofence, so to speak, and is more driven by uh, a state by state approach? I mean, our solution is a generalized solution, like what everybody else has. It, if you see it, like Waymo and whatnot, they have a very localized solution that requires high density mapping. It's not; it's quite fragile. Um, so, you know, that their ability to expand rapidly is, is limited. Um, our, you know, our solution is a, is a general solution that works anywhere. It would even work on a different Earth. So if you rendered a new Earth, it would work on a new Earth. Um, so it's the, there's this, this capability. I think in, in, in our experience, once we demonstrate that something is safe enough or significantly safer than human, uh, we find that regulators are supportive of deploying deployment of that capability. Um, it's difficult to argue with if you if you've got um, a large number of you know, if you've got billions of miles that show that. Um, in the future, unsupervised FSD is safer than human. What, what regulator could really stand in the way of that? Um, they would, they're morally, morally obligated to approve. So I don't think regulatory approval will be um, a limiting factor. Um, I should also say that you know the the self-driving capabilities of this, that um, are deployed outside of North America are far behind that in, in North America. So with the with version 12.5 um, and maybe 12.6, but, but pretty soon, um, we will ask for regular regulatory approval of the uh, Tesla supervised FSD in uh, Europe, China, and other countries. And I, I think we're likely to receive that uh, before the end of the year. Thank you. Which, which, which will be a helpful demand driver in those regions, obviously. Thank you. Uh, our, just just add large to Travis. In, ter in terms of, like, you know, as Elon said, in terms of regulatory approval, you know, the, the vehicles are governed by FMESS in the U.S., which is NHTSA, which is the same across all 50 states. The world rules are the same across all 50 states. So creating a generalized solution gives us the best opportunity to deploy in all 50 states reasonably. Of course, there are state and even local municipal level regulations that may apply to, you know, being a transportation company or deploying taxis. But, you know, as far as getting the vehicle on the road, that's that's all federal and that's very much in line with what you know, Elon was just suggesting about the data and, and the vehicle itself. And, and to add to the technology point, the end-to-end -end network basically makes no assumption about the location. Um, like you could add data from different countries and it would just like perform equally well there. Uh, there's like almost like close to zero US specific um, code in there. It's all just the data that comes from the US. Yeah, to, to that end, Michelle, it's like, you know, we can go as humans to other countries and drive with some reasonable amount of assessment in those countries. And, and that's how you design them. FSC software. Yeah, exactly. Great. Thanks, guys. Uh, the next question comes from George from Canaccord. George, please go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for taking my questions. Uh, maybe just to expand on the regulatory question for a second. And I, I could be comparing apples and oranges, but you know, GM canceled their pedalless, wheelless vehicle. Uh, and according to the company this morning, their decision was driven by uncertainty f about the regulatory environment. Um, and from what we understand, and, and again, maybe I'm wrong here, but the robo taxi that has been you know, shown, at least in the images of the public, is also pedalless and wheelless. Is there a different regulatory concern just if you deploy a vehicle like that that doesn't have you know, a pedal, a pedals or a wheel? And that may that be different from uh, just regular FSD on a traditional Tesla vehicle? Thank you. Well, obviously, the real reason that they canceled it is because GM can't make it work, not because of regulators. They're blaming regulators. Um, that's that's misleading of them to do, to do so, because um, Waymo is doing just fine in those markets. So it's it's just that their technology is not up to par. Right. 
Um, and maybe just a, as a follow-up, I think you mentioned uh, that FSD take rates were up materially after you uh, reduced the price. Is there any way you can help us quantify what that means exactly? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, you know, we've shared the, that how that there, we've seen a meaningful increase. I don't want to get into specific because we started from a low base, and but we we are seeing encouraging results, and and the key thing here is like Elon said, you need to experience it because words can't describe it till the time we actually use it. And that's why we are trying to make sure that every time a car is getting delivered, people are being showed how this thing is working. Because when you see it working, you realize how great it is. I mean, just to give you one example, so again, there's a bias example, but I have a more than 20-mile commute into the factory almost every day. I have zero interventions on the latest stack. And the car just literally drives me over. And especially with the latest version, wherein you know we're also tracking your eye movement, the steering wheel nag is almost not there, as long as you're not right. wearing sunglasses. Well, we're, we're fixing the sunglasses thing. <laughs> it's coming soon. So you, you will be able to drive. It will, <laughs> you will be able to have sunglasses on and have the car drive. Yeah. Um, so, um, but, uh, you know, there's the sure number of times I've talked with smart people who uh, like live in New York or in downtown Boston and um, don't ever drive um, and then are asking me about FSD and I'm like, uh, you can just get a car and try it. Um, and uh, if, if, you're, if you're not doing that, you have no idea what's going on. Thank you. Um, the next question comes from Pierre from New Street. Pierre, please unmute yourself. <laughs> Hey guys, thank you for taking my question. Um, so it's on uh, on robot taxi um, again, and I completely get it that with a universal solution, we will get like regulatory approval. We get there eventually, clicking clicking up miles and compute, etc. And my question is more: um, How you think about deployment? Because I'm still like I'm thinking once you have a car that can drive everywhere, that can replace me. Um, it can replace um, a taxi, but then to do the ride hailing service, you need a certain scale. Uh, and that means a lot of cars on the road, and so you need an infrastructure to, to just uh, maintain the cars, take care of them, etc. And so my question is, are you already working on that? Do you have already an idea of what like your plan to deploy looks like? And is that like a Tesla only plan, or are you looking at partners, local pla partners, global partners um, to do that? And I'll have a quick follow. Yeah, this, this would just be the Tesla network. You just literally open the Tesla app and summon a car, and and we send a car to pick you up and take you somewhere. Um, and the you can our. We will have a fleet that's I don't know, on the order of seven million that are capable of autonomy soon. Um, you know, in the years to come, it'll be over ten million, then over twenty million. Uh, this, this is an immense scale, um, and and the the car is able to operate twenty four seven, unlike the human driver. So uh, the, the capability to like it, there's this basically instant scale with a software update. Um, and now this is for a customer-owned fleet, um, so you can think of that as being a bit like Airbnb. Like, um, you know, you, you can choose to allow your car to be used by the fleet, or you know, cancel that and bring it back. It can be used by the fleet all the time. Uh, it can be used by the fleet some of the time, and then Tesla would take would share in the revenue with the customer. Uh, but you can think of the giant fleet of Tesla vehicles as like the giant sort of Airbnb equivalent fleet, Airbnb on wheels. Um, the, the, I mean, then, you know, in addition, we would make uh, some number of cars for Tesla that, that, that would just be owned by Tesla and be added to the fleet. I guess that would be a bit more like Uber. Um, but this, this would all be a Tesla network. Um, and, and there's an important clause we've put in in, in every Tesla 
purchase, which is that the Tesla vehicles can only be used in the Tesla fleet. They cannot be used by a third party for autonomy. Okay. And and do you think that scales like progressively so you can start in a city with just a, a handful of cars and you you grow the number of cars over time? Or do you think there is like a critical mass you need to get to to be able to offer like a service that is of uh, competitive quality compared to what like the like Uber would be typically delivering already? I, I guess I'm not maybe I'm not conveying this correctly. The entire Tesla fleet basically uh, becomes active. Um, you know, this is obviously maybe there's some number of people who don't want their car to earn money, but I think most people will. It's instant scale. Thank you. Uh, our next question comes from Colin from Oppenheimer. Colin, please unmute yourself. Sorry about that, guys. Um, you know, I've got two questions around energy storage. You know, with the, the tight supply and the stationary storage, can you talk about your pricing strategy and how you're thinking about saturation in given geographies, given that, you know, some of these larger systems are starting to shift uh, wholesale power markets in a pretty meaningful way quickly? So, yeah, I mean, you know, we are working with a large set of uh, players in the market and, you know, our pipeline is actually pretty pretty long, and there's actually a very there's actually a long end in terms of where you enter into a contract where delivery started starts happening, and so far we have good pricing leverage. And I'll have Mike chime in on this too. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of competition from Chinese OEMs, just like there is in the vehicle space. So. We're, we're in close contact with our customers and making sure that we're remaining competitive in where they're needing to be competitive to to secure contracts to sell power and energy in the markets. Um, we had a really strong contracting quarter and continue to build our backlog for 2025 and 2026. Um, so we feel pretty good about where we are in the market. We realize that um, competition is strong, but we have a pretty strong value proposition with you know offering a fully integrated product with our own power electronics and site level controls. So, yeah. And again, the aspect which people miss, do not fully uh, understand is that there's also a whole software stack which comes with our mega pack, right? And that is a unique proposition which we have, which is only available to us, and we're using it with other stuff too. But that gives us a much, much, much more of an edge as compared to the competition. Yeah. Yeah. We, or we find customers that. They, they can sort of put together a hodgepodge solution, um, and so, and then sometimes they'll pick that solution, um, and then that that doesn't work, it, um, and then they come back to us. Yeah, and we're not really seeing saturation for, like on a global scale. There's there's little pockets of saturation in different markets, but we're more seeing that there's there's markets opening up given demand on the grid just continues to increase more than anyone expects. Um, so that just opens up markets, you know, really across the world in, in different pockets. Yeah, I mean, okay. just just even on the AI compute side, right? These these uh, GPUs are really power hungry, and the amount of you know new pipeline which we're getting for people for data center backup and things like that is increasing at a pretty large scale. Yeah, thanks so much. And then the follow up here is something around the forty six eighty. Uh, process technology, you know, and the vulnerable process, you know, you, there's some news around your, your equipment suppliers, you know, can you talk about how far along you were in, in potentially qualifying an incremental supplier around some of the, those critical uh, process technology steps? Yeah, I can, I can talk about that. Um, you know, as you're probably referring to, to the, the lawsuit that we have with one of our suppliers, Look, I don't think this is going to affect our ability to, to roll out 4680. You know, we have very strong IP position in the technology and, you know, the majority of the equipment that we use is in-house designed and some of it's in-house built. Um, and so we can we can take our our um, IP stack and, and have someone else build it if, if, we, if we need to. So that's not really a concern right now. Yeah, 
I think people don't understand just how much demand there will be for for storage. Um, they really just like the, the people I think are underestimating this demand by probably orders of magnitude. Um, so that the, the actual um, energy total energy output of say the U.S. grid is if if the power plants can operate uh, at steady state is at least two to three times uh, the amount of energy it currently produces. Uh, because there are huge gaps, there's a, there's a huge difference in the um, from peak to trough in terms of, en of energy or power generation. So, uh, you, in order for a grid to not have blackouts, it must be able to support the load at the worst minute of the worst day of the year, the coldest or hottest day, which means that for the rest of the time, the rest of the year, it's got massive excess. Um, power generation capability, but it has no way to store that, that energy. Um, once you add battery packs, you can now run the power plants um, at steady state. Steady state means that you know, basically any given grid anywhere in the world can um, produce in terms of cumulative energy in the course of a year at least twice what it is currently producing, in some cases maybe three times. All right, thank you. Uh, the this next is a very profound thing. Great. Thank you, Elon. Uh, the next question comes from Colin Langan from Wells Fargo. Colin, please unmute yourself. Oh, great. Um, thanks, for t uh, thanks for taking my questions. Um, do you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I, I guess we're going to ask, you know, if, if Trump wins, there's a higher chance that IRA could get cut. I think, Elon, you had commented online that Tesla doesn't survive on EV subsidies. But, but when Tesla lose a lot of support, if IRA goes away, I think Model Y, 3 and Y get IRA help for customers, and I think your batteries get production tax credits. So, so just one, can you clarify if the end, if IRA ends, you know, would it be a, a negative for your profitability in the near term? Why might it not be a negative? And then, you know, any framing of the, the current, you know, support you get IRA related. Um, I, mean, I guess that there would be like some impact, but it, I, mean, I think it would be devastating for our competitors, but, uh, and, and it would hurt Tesla slightly. Um, but long term, probably actually helps Tesla. It would be my guess. Um, yeah. Um, but yeah, and I've said this before in these calls. Uh, it, the value of Tesla overwhelmingly is autonomy. Um, th these other things are in the noise relative to autonomy. So I recommend anyone who doesn't believe. That Tesla will sell vehicle autonomy should, should not hold Tesla stock. They should sell their Tesla stock. Uh, they should believe Tesla will sell autonomy. You should buy Tesla stock. And uh, all these other questions are um, in the noise. Yeah, I mean, Go I'll ahead. ask this just to, just to clarify a few things. That at the end of the day, when we are looking at our business, we've always been looking at it whether or not IRA is there. And we want our business to grow healthy without having any, you know, subsidies coming in, whichever way you look at it. And that's the way we have always modeled everything. And that is the way internally also, even when we're looking at battery costs, yes, IRA, there are manufacturing credits which we get, but we always drive ourselves to say, okay, what if there is no IRA benefit? And how do we operate in that kind of an environment. And like Elon said, we definitely have a big advantage as compared to our competition on that front. We've delivered it and you can see it in the numbers over the years. Like, so that there is, you, you cannot ignore the fundamental sides of the business. And then on top of it, once you add autonomy to it, like Elon said, it becomes meaningless to even think about the, the short term. Okay. Um, I think that's unfortunately all the time we have for today. Uh, we appreciate all of your questions. We look forward to talking to you next quarter. Thank you very much and goodbye. Thanks, thanks.